Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the latest in our series of Lunchtime Seminars. Um, today we have John Burton. Uh, John? I don't know where they're applauding next to us. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Remote applause. Um, uh, John has worked in the highest level of live sound engineering for many years, touring internationally with a wide variety of acts in a diverse range of venues. In recent years, John has worked primarily in arenas and stadiums, as well as in a large number of open air festivals, including Glastonbury, Rock Skilda, Rock AM, Ring Slash Park, and Miami Ultra Festivals. Rock and Ring Slash Park, am I getting that right? It's Rock and Ring and Rock in Park. It's rock two, in park. two big German festivals. Sister, sister festivals. If there's any metal fans in the audience, then I'm open to them. Yeah. Dear, I'm betraying myself as not a metal fan. <laughs> um, his work has predominantly been as the sound engineer for a headline act with responsibility for many aspects of the sound design and implementation, most recently as front of house sound engineer for Biffy Clyro and since 2004 The Prodigy. John is now a senior lecturer in entertainment engineering at the University of Derby and has co-authored several papers primarily in the field of perception of low frequency sound and noise control. He's currently working on an international certification for noise awareness, HELA, in conjunction with the AES and the Nighttime Industries Association. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to John. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for the invitation as well. Um, thank you, Mark, for inviting me over and getting a chance to talk to you. Um, so I'm here kind of wearing two hats at the moment. So the first one is kind of uh, my academic role um, as a senior lecturer in entertainment engineering, uh, which is how I met Mark. Uh, I was, I've been a sound engineer since I left school, really. I fell into it um, through a love of music. Through a love of music and an insatiable uh, appetite for taking things to apart and trying to get myself electrocuted. So I was kind of always the person, there's always someone in the band who volunteers to fix things, and that was always me. And then I started getting interested, then I bought a small PA system, then it all went horribly wrong for about 30 years, then I managed to get a proper job. But in that time, uh, I actually, I was always interested in sound, I was interested in, in learning more, and I kind of, uh, I was always interested in exploring why why I was hearing things, how, how I was hearing things, what were the answers to questions, why was this happening, why was that happening, why did the sub never sound really good everywhere in the venue? Uh, that was the greatest problem, still working on that one. Um, eventually I ended up going to do a master's degree by research at the University of York, which is where I met Mark, because we studied at the same time. And uh, then I fell into full-time education. Uh, I've worked for Bank of Prodigy for, well, I just finished working with them. I just retired from life touring uh, in October last year. Um, but when one of the singers, Keith Flint, died, I panicked, thought I was never going to get another job ever again, and decided to get a job as an academic. So I became uh, a lecturer at the University of Derby, where I teach entertainment engineering. So I teach a lot to do with sound, as much to do with equipment, and the first thing they ever gave me to teach was academic writing. So I guess got to teach academic writing to 120 students in the class, which was based on my experience of having written one academic paper, which was my master's. Because mm -hmm. I did master's by research, so I never went to any lectures, and I didn't do an undergraduate degree. That was my first higher education. <laughs> so why they thought I was qualified, I then soon realized that I was qualified by the fact that I was new. And teaching uh, academic writing to foundation year students was not everyone's favorite task. Um, so I managed to keep that up for three years before I managed to find some new victim to pass it on to. Um, but I'm here to talk also as a life sound engineer and all that kind of experience I've got. So I've got an interest in uh, why, how we measure sound, why we measure sound, from kind of two sides. So, um, I should have my clicker. significant way and this is they're being measured for a particular reason and there's usually someone there doing the measuring 
and it's usually someone professional doing the measuring. So in most of my career, the times I've come across events that are actually measured um, for technical reasons tends to be large festivals. Because for most of my uh, career as a life science engineer, certainly the last 10 years, most of my work has been uh, festivals, usually with a headline act, so working with the Prodigy or bands like Biffy Clyro. Um, I'll be doing the headline act at a festival. These are usually events that are monitored, or I'll be going into arenas uh, all around the world, um, which gives you loads of different experience of working in lots of different countries, all of whom have got very different attitudes towards noise measurement. Um, that is worth a surprise. <laughs> so uh, let's hear it first of all for Switzerland. <laughs> so Switzerland was the first place I went to where anyone ever really took noise measurement seriously. And they were probably one of the first countries to introduce noise measurements to uh, gigs. And almost, I think almost all gigs in Switzerland have a noise measurement. Um, it's different depending on what language they speak and at which particular canton it is. So each canton has got a slightly different rule, but they tend to tend to measure and they tend to try and enforce 100 dB A over 60 minutes. And that tends to be pretty much talk for Switzerland. That tends to be pretty much the same everywhere. This is the first time I came across this, and I came across this probably 30 years ago. And it was probably 10 years until I came across something like that anywhere else. But certainly in Europe was the sort of places, it was the first places I've kind of experienced this thing of being measured. As an engineer, having someone there making measurements of what I was doing, checking what I was doing. For the first 20 years of my career, I could pretty much do whatever I want. And all I get is someone in the audience coming up to me going, either it's a bit loud or can you make it louder? And to probably equal amounts, actually, probably more people asking me to make it loud than asking me to turn it down. Probably more bar managers telling me to turn it down. But uh, generally, no real great control until I went to Switzerland. That was my first experience of someone actually coming up and saying, do you know how loud you are? And I'm going, just loud enough? And they're going, well, actually, you're 103 dB over 15 minutes, and we'd like you to turn down. I'm going, ah. So I was an early adopter of technology because it was important because I realised that uh, there's always a stick attached to this, isn't there? As there's a noise measurement cable, there's always some kind of stick. In Switzerland, it's a healthy fine. Who's going to get fined? And I afford £10,000 fine. No, because I'm a lowly self-employed sound engineer. So I began to start paying more attention to what actually happened. Um, what are my interests purely health reasons? No, because I was fairly ignorant, really. I was probably like most people working in that time period. We're talking about, we're probably talking about the early 90s at this point, before some of you were born. <clears throat> we're talking about uh, a time when hearing health was discussed but not really openly and not really intelligently. Um, so I'm going to talk about large music events because this tends to be where, in my career, most of the problems and most of the uh, legislation is, uh, is adheres to and where you can come into contact with measurement. Most small gigs still do not measure sound, certainly in the UK. Uh, and I gave this talk to a lot of people from the Institute of Acoustics and everyone in the room just went, oh, what do you mean? It's Noise at Work Act. Noise at Work Act, 2005. And no one has ever quoted that to me at a gig that I have mixed. And I've been mixing for 40 years. So no one in the UK has ever quoted that act at me. In festivals where I'm running a big show in front of thousands of people, that is not the act they're quoting at me. What they're quoting at me, I'll come to that in a minute. So we're going to talk about large festivals. This is the lovely Biffy Clyro, which I think is probably down large festival. And guys, if you can guess this gig, anyone know where this is? Again, okay, it's in London. So this is the lovely Brixton Academy. Yeah. It's about 7,000 capacity. Yeah. Um, 
And so what do we mean by monitoring when we're talking about noise monitoring? Uh, so this is, you all recognize this kind of standard handheld meter. Um, an NTI system with a kind of tracker light thing saying, you are too loud, you're pushing it a bit, you're fine. Um, which is actually quite helpful. Or, and this is my system, which is a 10 easy system, which I'll come to in a bit. So what do we mean by monitoring? Uh, who's doing the monitoring? Quite often, the monitoring is being done by an acoustic consultant who's been brought in by the local, by the promoter or the local council, or it's someone from the local council doing the monitoring. <laughs> and they're there to make sure that you're sticking to pre-agreed noise level. Hopefully, I know what this noise level is before we start. This is not always the case. Hopefully, it's within the realms of possibility. Um, there is an expectation amongst audiences that the, the gig is going to be a certain, how do we describe it, loudness. Loudness, of course, is perceptual. Sound pressure level is not. Sound pressure level is a metric. So it's going to sound loud to the audience. What's the audience's greatest concern, do you think? Sounds good. It's going to sound good. And what do they want to hear? <laughs> if they come to my gigs, yes, they want to hear the bass. <laughs> Most people want to hear the vocals. They want to hear the vocals. They want to be able to sing along with the words. Uh, and that's their expectation. And wherever they, if you can see the stage, should you be able to hear it? Yeah, I think it's a fair assumption. You buy a ticket if you see the stage, you should be able to hear it. So they want to be able to hear the sound, probably the venue. They want to be able to hear it and get a good audio experience. There's going to be someone standing with a meter and measuring it. Um, or, in this case, there's going to be me measuring myself. <clears throat> so there's going to be someone with a meter. Hopefully, it will be an audio professional. Um, this is not always the case, because a lot of venues, the metering is done by the local council, and it's done by someone who's working as an environmental health officer. Most environmental health officers have got lots of jobs on their plates. And to be honest, the, uh, the smallest part of their job is making sure that sound levels are the right, uh, are correct. They're more interested in people poisoning you. <laughs> they spend more time walking around checking kitchens aren't trying to kill you in local restaurants and things like that than actually going out and taking noise measures. The number of times I've had to show an environmental health officer how their uh, unit works is quite scary because they usually get a sort of one hour training course. Yeah, you need to look at that. It's that figure there. And you probably you probably need to press some of those other buttons. So spending a lot of time taking it off fast or just putting it in like waiting is really important. Um, so there's usually going to be someone there with some kind of meter. And what are we measuring? So a festival, what are we measuring? We're measuring the sound pressure level and it tends to happen primarily at the front of house position. Now, the front of house position is where the mixing desks are in front of the stage. Uh, a festival is between 30 and 40 metres from the stage, and it usually gives a good indication of what the general sound is for the majority of the audience. Is it the loudest point in the audience? Where would you think that would be? Right for the crash barrier. Right for the crash barrier, nearer the sound source. Um, but they don't tend to make measurements there. They tend to make them at the, the front of house position. Some countries have considered this problem, that it is different there, and they will do an offset. They'll say, because it's 100 dB here, we know it's going to be 106 there. And they'll make, uh, and they'll actually make a calculation. This is rare. It tends to be only uh, the Luxembourgians do it well. Luxembourg always does an offset, parts of Germany do. Um, but what are we measuring? So the general assumption is that we're measuring this. So this represents a large loudspeaker system, the one that's pointing out across the audience. And this is a main source of the sound. But if anyone is familiar with this band, <laughs> they will know that this makes a significant noise as well. 
So when I'm being told to turn down and I'm doing this band, I can turn this off. Will the noise go away? No. So this makes a significant contribution to the sound. Uh, the Prodigy have got a reputation of being fairly loud on stage, which is well deserved. I don't go on, well, I avoid going up on the stage at the Prodigy show because it's way too loud for me. Uh, way too not loud for normal people. And it's a significant noise. So uh, at a front of house mix position, it's not unusual for it to be 90 dB just from the stage sound, which is significant, a significant noise. <clears throat> so what are we measuring? We're not measuring just this. We're measuring whatever's coming off the stage. So I've only got control over this. Um, I know people who've worked for him when he was still alive, and they were, would, none of them would ever go up and say, Mr. Kilminster, you just turn down the bit? Because that would be the end of your career with the band. Um, so you've only got limited control over what happens up here. Nowadays, um, I don't know which, if you've seen any uh, shows in the arenas, a lot of bands have actually got a lot quieter on stage. A lot of bands are using in-ear monitoring. Intermittent monitoring gives you the chance to be able to hear everything you need to hear using some earbuds, which are a wireless pack. So uh, some of the bands I work with, it's really nice because this, it's actually quite quiet on stage, which is great for engineers because we get us a lot more control over what comes out of here because there's very little coming off here. <laughs> so when I'm told to turn down, I actually can have that level of control. I've also got a little level of finesse. I can show off a bit more as an engineer because I've got more control over everything. Unfortunately, none of the bands I ever work with use in-ear monitors and have quiet stages. Biffy Clyro started off as having a quiet stage and then uh, I'm stupid. The guitar said, I'm not really happy. Can I go back to having my amps? And I just went, I'd rather you were happy. Use your amps. And then you got all these amps back out again and it just went back to being a loud thing again. But this is the way things are. Keeping the band happy is good performance. A good performance means the audience enjoy it more. If the audience enjoy it more, the word gets around, more people come to the next show. And the, the treadmill keeps going and it becomes a more profitable concern. We're also measuring this. What's this? This is the inconvenience, the audience, the people who pay for it all. Um, how much noise do the audience make? Has anyone ever been to, uh, I had to, there used to be, I'll go back a bit, there used to be a magazine for children, for teenagers called Smash Hits. Um, there's, there's about to be some kind of online equivalent now that uh, promote gigs. What, has anyone been to a gig that their 14 or 15 year old brother or sister would love to go to? Or did you go to gigs when you were 14 or 15? What was it like? Can you remember? Screaming. Lots of screaming. I went to the Smash Hits gig and it was just awful. What a noise, just people screaming. And uh, my friends that I'm working with, Marcel Cock, has been doing some, he did a paper uh, last year which he kept trying to call yelling. The problem with yelling, we'd actually turned into uh, audience participatory noise. So he was doing, uh, he was doing shows with Oh, name some annoying emails. Justin Bieber. They're doing <laughs> Justin Bieber shows. So he's doing Justin Bieber shows, and Justin Bieber audience are 5 dB louder than Justin Bieber. <laughs> so if you look at the measurements, it goes Justin Bieber, audience. Justin Bieber, audience. So how do you turn down the audience? We can't really, can we? Um, so we're measuring this as well. We're measuring the contributory factor of the audience. I did a particularly difficult show at Rocking Ring um, where the noise measurement was measured at front of house in a thunderstorm with thunder and lightning. <laughs> and the guy's going, you've got to turn it down. I said, the band aren't even playing. <laughs> it's too loud. It's not me. <laughs> Put your head outside. If it gets wet, you know it's raining. So uh, we're measuring the environment, aren't we? We're measuring everything around, so we can only control. We're measuring everything. So where were we measuring? So I mentioned before, we tend to measure about here, in front of the stage. 
Um, so this is from NoiseCalc, which is uh, actually a bit of software that, uh, that's, this one's done with conjunction with loud speaker manufacturer called DMV Audio Technic. Uh, so you can drop their speakers onto a sort of geo plot and it will give you a rough idea of what the sound system is going to do. And it's going to give you a rough idea of what the sound system is going to do in the local environment, which is very handy for planning. Because do the planners really care what's happening here? Well, the people who do the licensing, do they care what's happening here? So, so. Do they care what's happening here? Because these look like houses. So most of the time when we're dealing with noise problems, we're dealing with local residents. So most of the work that we're doing concerns our impact on the local environment. And our local and the impact on local environment is pretty much down to local businesses during the daytime and residents at night. And it's, can you hear the music? And has the music stopped being music and become noise? Because noise is annoying. Noise is, the, is our negative attitude towards sound. And there's various stipulations. We tend to stick to between 55 and 65 dB for local residents. And this is pretty much the same all around the world. So during the daytime, we could probably go to 65 dB A. At nighttime, after 11 o'clock, we have to drop down to 55 dB A. Um, usually measured over a 15 minutes and 30 or to 60 minute period time period. So this is the important thing. So it's where are we measuring? So where does it make sense to measure? Just like areas offside. Yeah, so it makes sense to measure. So we tend to do a measurement. We'll probably do a measurement there because that looks like the nearest local residence. And this is where we'll set the, the level to. We usually have to do some kind of propagation test. So in the afternoon, when you just finally manage to get everything set up, someone will come along and going, we're going to do a propagation test now. And you're going, actually, can you plug it all in? It doesn't matter, it has to be done. Send some noise out. So someone will play some track, usually hugely inappropriate. And someone at the local residence driven all the way out there going, yeah, yeah, can you make the noise now? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I'm getting 65 dB. Yeah, that's fine. That should be fine for tonight. <clears throat> And then we'll set a level at front of house, except the level is not going to be set by a propagation test because they're going to generally go for something that they know is a safe-ish kind of level that they can operate at, which is usually between 98 and 100 dB. Measured it's somewhere between one minute and an hour. <clears throat> so they're going to think about, and that's going to be the level measured at front of house. Because front of house, what's good about measuring at front of house? It's where the sound engineer is. So if you want it turning down, you just have to turn around to them and go, can you turn down, please? So it's a very practical place to do the measurement. It's also usually dry. Um, it's in front of the stage. It's fairly representative of the majority of the audience, apart from people down from where it is louder. Uh, so there's a good place to do it from. <coughs> At front of house festival, you've usually got a coffee machine and a fridge and stuff like that and water. So it's quite a good, you know, if you are the noise measurement festival, it's quite a good place to hang out. Everyone wants to be nice to you because they want you to be nice to them. <laughs> so it's not a bad place to be. <clears throat> so how and what are we measuring? <laughs> so this is a screenshot from a uh, software and a well, software hardware solution that I use, which is called TenEasy. And it kind of shows uh, shows a gig really so <clears throat> we tend to be measuring la eq um rather than lc eq now i know you're all quite clever here so <clears throat> we're talking about two different weightings a weighting and c weighting now c weighting is fairly close to flat it's not flat but it's fairly close to flat and it kind of represents a uh, human here at about 100 db around that area, which is kind of the area that we're mixing show at. That's kind of our, I want to usually hit my show, I want to hit around 100 dB. That's an acceptable, what I would consider an acceptable level. 
that's for the loudest part of my show. If I could stay at an average of 100 dB for a loud show, that's quite good for me. <clears throat> so, uh, but that's 100 dB at, at A weighting. And A weighting has got all that low frequency rolled off because it's for listening at about 55 to 65 dB. So why are we using A weighting? Because the measurement that matters is the measurement at the local residency. It's not the measurement of front of house because the front of house, nobody really cares. Because we're not really interested in health, we're interested in maintaining a license and maintaining a license con condition that's based on a local residence. Because if the local residents complain, and we can't say we kept it to the legal limit or the recognised limit of 55, 65, then the festival might not happen next year. And we want the festival to happen next year because there's lots of money involved in this and we want to propagate this thing, keep the audience happy, keep the local residents happy. So we use an A-weighted measurement. But we can't start mixing measurements in different places, can we? So we use an A-weighted measurement in front of house. So when I talk about mixing a show at 100 dB, I'm talking about an A-weighted measurement. I'm mixing a band like the Prodigy. Is anyone familiar with the band the Prodigy? Are you familiar that low frequencies are fairly significant for a Prodigy show? In fact, I say a certain amount of pride in the significance of the low frequencies at a Prodigy show. So is that represented accurately in an A-weighted reading? No because it's going to ignore pretty much everything below 50 hertz. Where do I get excited? I get excited just below 50 hertz. As soon as the sound drops below 50 hertz, I go, oh, this is interesting. I like this. So uh, my first experiment with this was at the V Festival in about 2006. There used to be a festival that happens, um, it's like a two-site festival, a bit like Reading and Leeds, and it's called the V Festival. And I decided to try and convince the festival to let me bring in 60,000 watts of extra subs to make it quieter. It was a bit of a hard sell, but my theory was that if I put in lots of energy below 50 hertz, it would give people the feeling that it was loud, because of course it would be loud. <clears throat> but the A-weighted measurement would be pretty much unaffected, because I'd have to get the sub really, really loud, and I'm not going to get an extra 40 dB of sub, am I, compared to the mids and tops? I mean, that it'd be nice, but it's going to, be, it's going to take a lot of subs. So I bought some single 21-inch subs, all driven by 5,000 watt amplifier, and I bought 12 of them in, 60,000 watts of extra sub. Just doing <clears throat> 40 hertz and below. So it's just, not all the time, just bringing in for the effect. When it came in, people would go, that sounds really loud. <clears throat> and we managed to run the start of the show up probably about one or two dB quieter than I normally would. And we came in quite a lot low. What was the impact off site? It was a bit bassier. But we were still within those tolerances of meeting 55 and 65 dB at the local residence because everyone's using this A weighting, which is me cheating the system. <laughs> um, but that's my job because I'm employed by the band and part of my uh, work for the band is I want a good experience for the audience and uh, going from what comments I got from the people who were at the gig they're going yeah, that was good because luckily a lot of them share the same love so that I've got so they're going yeah that was good how do you do that go, it's easy you just need 60,000 watts of extra base spins it's easy <clears throat> But I'm cheating the system, I'm sorry. But that's my job. I work for the band. I don't work for the local authority. I don't work for the PA company. I don't work for anyone apart from the band. And my, my responsibility is to the band and ultimately to the audience. Do I think that was damaging? No, because I don't think, and I'm still, there's still, we're still out on this, how much effect very low frequency sound so has in that uh, non-continuous way on the human body. I'm still, still investigating that, and other people are still investigating that. Um, so we're making these measurements, and most people are making the measurements on an A weighting. 
Some countries have now started introducing two two way system. So you're actually allowed an A weighting, but they're actually looking at the C weighting as well. So now some countries have got gone. What did the prodigy do? Can't be right. We must stop them from doing that. Let's introduce C weighting so John can't get away with it. So a couple of companies have looked at this because it it, it is a problem, low frequency sound, because low frequency sound goes further, doesn't it? It's uh, less uh, less like, likely to be affected by atmospheric conditions. Well, no, it's not less likely to be. It's still going to be affected by atmospheric conditions, but you're going to get less. It's going to carry a lot further. So I was trying to say without being too getting bogged down into too much technology. <clears throat> so who is measuring? So normally it's, it's we've got people coming on site who are spending a lot of time making these measurements and they're going to go off site and they're going to go off site. A lot of them now taking measurements off site and relaying it back in. They've now got clever, so we've now got network systems. We've got network systems at the local residences that can be left at the local residences. And we've got people at front of house and we've got specialist companies now who have decent monitoring system where they're mapping what's going on around festivals. So we've got a lot more control. In probably a third of the festivals around the world, it's now quite sensible. There's still, if you go to America, there is still, still no unified, unified noise levels across uh, all the different states, and every state has different ordinances for each city. Um, Belgium's my favourite. Belgium has a few. It's different for if you're in the French-speaking part of Belgium compared to the Flemish-speaking part of Belgium, which is good, the linguistic difference of 2 dB. So it's 2 dB, you have to be 2 dB quieter in the French-speaking bit. Uh, we've got a, hard, got a whole list of it, we've published a paper on it, and it just, you look through it, it just doesn't make any sense. The best one, though, is this, uh, um, I won't name the country, but there's one country just photocopied the uh, legislation from the country next door, and with felt it pen, changed the name of the country on top, <laughs> which is brilliant. And so who is measuring? I always measure. And I have done this for what I've been measuring now my shows for 20 years because I want a class one meter, which is data logging that tells everyone how loud I am mixing at front of the house. Why? Because someone at some point is going to try and take me to court. So uh, I was in this uh, fairly horrible gig in Belgium called the Forest National, which is a big old arena and it's got a noise level. Uh, you've got to mix below 100 dB over a 10 minute period. 100 dBA with, I think it's got a, a, a dBC peak as well. So you can't peak above a certain, it's like 130 dBC peak that you're not allowed to go above. And the guy came at the end of the go going, oh, that was loud. Yes, yeah, you went over the level. That's a 20,000 euro fine. And we're going, okay, when did they go over the level? During the show. Yes, we'd like to be slightly more accurate. Well, during the show, you went over level. Okay, well, you sh show you its figures, and we'll see you in court. He said, and this kind of conversation when it's of, as we men monitored using a class one system, and we're quite happy to go to court and discuss this with you there. So then we'll show you your data, and I'll tell you where it was. And I was going, I'll show you my data in court. And strangely enough, the argument disappeared and went away. So it's really important for me to protect myself, but also having measured levels over this amount of time, it became, I became a lot more aware of what level I'm mixing at. And um, so I always, I think it was, it improved me as an engineer to actually mix to a, a set level. So I'd always have a set level where I'd actually be looking at sound pressure level because sound pressure level is a metric that's fixed. Loudness is perceptual. I could be mixing a show that I think is loud and it could be very high sound pressure level. Or I could be mixing a show that I think is loud that can be a low sound pressure level. But I've got to be aware of those two because my brain doesn't tell me what the sound pressure level is. It only tells me how loud I think it is. So that makes sense. So we need this. So I actually working with the middle all the time really helped me understand what levels were. And I'm probably better than most people at guessing sound pressure levels because I've had a lot of experience of coordinating what I hear 
with being able to see something. Uh, in the same way as working as a monitor engineer, I learned all the ISO third octave frequencies. So I could just go 400, 500, 1K6, because you get used to hearing these things once you're using them all the time. So and authorities are measuring, but I'm also, and lots of other engineers I know, are also measuring ourselves. Um, but there's still lots of problems. So this document uh, came out in 2022, uh, and it was a combination of work for a lot of colleagues. Um, and my colleague at Derby, Adam Hill, went to Geneva. So when all the world is kicking off with COVID, they were sitting in a room discussing noise levels around the world and what we're going to do to help with hearing. And uh, lots of very interesting conversations go because obviously I've become a lot more interested in hearing health because I have to be a responsible member of society because I am a sound engineer, but I also have to be a responsible sound engineer. And I wouldn't knowingly put members of the audience at harm. So I always make sure there's a good gap between the speakers and the barrier. So when you're down the front of the barrier, it is loud, but hopefully it's not damaging. Um, I can't guarantee it, but I, I do do the best I can to make sure that I'm operating in a safe system. And I have refused to use systems or got them to restack systems that I thought would be potentially dangerous. When you get uh, clusters of speakers, especially when you're using techniques like rear fire, where you've got a small uh, amount of speakers in a very small area where you've got a potentially very high sound pressure level, even though, yeah, that's great, you can fire like a fire a mile and a half with it, at the front there at the barrier, it's going to be 147 dB. Is that sensible? No. I always try and stack a distributed array that's not going to be as loud. That means you're not going to get that build of high sound pressure in one particular place. So becoming very aware with uh, the responsibilities we have as engineers, um, Adam went to the uh, World Health Organization to join in these discussions about producing a global standard for safe listening. The interesting thing that he discovered on day one is that we don't all have the same vocabulary. So when discussing low frequency noise, what we would call sub, the audiologists were thinking around 250 hertz, which is quite a way off what I consider to be sub. So when they're going, they're going, so you're talking about limiting sub, what do you mean? And so he was actually in the toilet talking to her. What do you mean by sub? And they're going, about 250 hertz. He's going, no, really, way down. They're going, no. He's going, yeah, no way. Yeah, we're, we're interested in 50 hertz. In fact, John's interested in 30 hertz. He thinks that's where we should start. So there was this whole conversations. Um, and this happened just before COVID. And we looked at... Loads of conversations came up with that and loads of things where they were looking at how are we going to measure this? Because what should we be doing? Um, if we going to say it needs to be a certain level and it ended up being 100 dB, was 100 dBA was the recommended level, how long are we going to make that measurement over? What time period? Because it has to be related to what you're measuring. So what would be an appropriate time period? Any ideas? Minute, 15 minutes, 15 minutes is a good one. 15 minutes is good because it gives you a chance for a song, a gap, a song, and it gives you a good average time period. Anything below five minutes is kind of, it could just be a big loud song followed by some quiet. But we're talking about exposure over a long period of time is what the greatest concern of is with hearing health. So we want something that represents that time span. So, all the world health organizations going, what, 60 minutes? We'll do it over an hour. Now, if you do it over an hour, you've got to start your show. And you're not going to know that you've reached your limit for an hour until you've done the hour, which is the end of your gig. Or you're halfway, two thirds of the way through your gig. It always gets to the point where it's going, yeah, you're doing really, really well. Actually, actually, no, and maybe you're not doing so well. Actually, you know, really, really doing really badly. You're going to stop now. And you turn the PA off and you're going, well, I've only 40 minutes into the set. I've used up my hours worth of time. So we have to have a shorter time period so that we can know what's happening. We've got to have some kind of predictability. So predicting what's going to happen over the uh, 
things. So looking at rolling averages. So we've got some idea of what's going to happen over the hour. So we can look into the future a bit as best as one can. So between a five minute and 15 gives a good indication and it gives the engineer a chance to see where they're sat and do they need to come down? Because I will watch the meter all the way through the show and I'll know I'm not going to start at 100 dB because then I've got nowhere to go. And the most important thing about music is it should be a dynamic thing. It should go up and down. The exciting thing about music is the changes between the loud bits and the quiet bits. That's what makes it exciting. If you don't have dynamics, you don't have an interesting show. So I need to have somewhere to go. So I need to go up somewhere, climb down, down a bit, go up a bit more, come down a bit, go up a bit more. So hopefully I've left enough headroom at the end, but I can do that big thing of the big bass drop at the end and everyone goes, wow, because that's the bit they'll remember. And they remember thinking, that was a really loud show. I like that. But actually, it was only actually really loud right at the very end. But that's the bit you remember. It's the very last thing you hear. So you've got to kind of bring this up. So you've got to be aware of where you're going. So you've got to have something that where your average is following what you do to a certain extent so that you can then follow it. So you know which works you play. So when that makes sense to a point, that you've got this ability to play with level. So we pushed for um, a good average and the World Health Organization are going, well, why? Why do you want to do it like that? You've got to prove it. So we end up going over, luckily I've worked with the same band for a large amount of time and I've got, I think we looked at something like 250 shows, 50 or 60 of which were all the same bands using very similar equipment, but with different noise measurement times at different festivals. So I'm using a big line array in a big field, mixing pretty much the same songs uh, <clears throat> to what I would consider the same level. And we're looking at my success of being able to do it. So we look at places where it's a one minute average and it's just awful because I'm always reacting. It's too loud, it's too quiet, it's too loud, it's too quiet because it's moving too quickly. And it's worth trying to do this. If you do any mixing, put a noise level meter and try and mix to an average when it's on a really fast setting because you've got no idea because the snare drum goes, it's too loud. The snare drum stops, it's fine. It's too loud, it's fine. So it's really difficult to follow those, those peaks. You need some kind of averaging so that you're not constantly trying to chase things. One minute is too fast, you just can't do it. It's a real struggle. Um, if it's too, lo too long, I just have to, be, I start really, really quiet because I just don't know what I'm going to be like in an hour's time. It's really hard to mix to. So we worked out that the best shows were about 10 minutes. And so it was settled at a 15 minute. So we end up spending most of uh, COVID rushing through loads of papers, looking at all the regulations around the world, which was a sketch, as we said, and, and try to uh, feed information into papers so that we could actually go, done it, look, look, can you please pay attention to this? And actually, if you are interested in the subject, that document is a really, really well written, good read. Um, for sound engineers, it's it's going to compromise some people, but I think it's probably going to compromise people who probably need to be compromised. So I mixed the last Prodigy tour to the WHO global standard of 100 dB over 15 minutes. I mixed all the arena shows. It, I went over it once. So I did one show at 101, but I kept all the rest just below 100 dB A over a 15 minute average. Just to prove that I could do it, because I spent all this time going, get this into it. So I just sort of put my money where my mouth is. <clears throat> so that was this is what they came up with. Uh, sound level limits below 100 dBA uh, over 15 minutes. <clears throat> and then consider this keeping sound safe and enjoyable for the audience. Um, and live monitoring of sound levels is performed by a designated staff member using calibrated equipment. Um, We've got to have standards. We've got to have people who turn up who know how a noise meter works. Who didn't know how a noise meter works when they first started? Just randomly pressing, it's supposed to be showing you something. Especially once with like graphic, graphical displays and going, what's that mean? What's, it, what's fast? What's slow? What's A? What's C? What's Z? What's just flat? 
there's lots of questions and this uh, so having that kind of level of understanding is really important um but also along with this started a load of other conversations which were interesting sound systems and venues acoustics are optimized ensuring safe listening and improved sound quality so they said you should look at the actual sound systems and how they're deployed and what spaces are they employed in because one of the things that came out of the work was the fact that uh, some shows on my tours were significantly higher and significantly lower than other ones um, so they've knocked it down now now but uh, there was a particularly horrible ice rink in Russia, a place called Prem, that you just walk in and you know your reverberation room. That's pleasant compared to this place. Uh, it was not only did it sound fantastically awful, but most of the ceiling tiles were falling down and it was being demolished a week after we were there. It looked like it was being demolished while we were there. And we spent most of the time wearing, guess what? wearing masks because we th we didn't know if it's asbestos falling out of the roof. Uh, but I had to mix. I found myself mixing high because I was trying to get over the reverberation in the room. I was trying to fight the sound in the room. And this is quite common if you go into a reverberable of spaces, you try and fight against it as an engineer uh, to try and get some kind of clarity to kind of saturate the room so that you can get some kind of feeling, uh, some kind of anything really, anything that's pleasant out of an unpleasant situation. The flip side of that was going into places, uh, there's two purpose-built venues in Amsterdam. There's, uh, <coughs> there's an arena, which I can't remember the name of, and a place called the Musical, the Heineken Musical. The Heineken Musical was a hall built for amplified music. Um, it's interesting because it's got a short reverberation time, it's about 1.3 seconds, but it's got a very low uh, reverberation time at low frequencies of 0.9. So it's a very tight sounding uh, room. So you can put loads of noise into it and it just sounds great for amplified reason. If you try and do a string quartet in there, it would sound dead and awful, but we don't do that very often. They never do that in there. It's for amplified music. So I mix that show 3 dB quieter than any show on the rest of the tour, which is quite a good signal because I'm mixing, my average was kind of 99, across the entire tour, and I'm mixing that one at 96, which I would just look at it going, it's way too quiet. There's no way I mixed it at that, but it was in the data because I'm not fighting the room. The room's working with me. So thinking about that, optimising the venue acoustics, making gigs sound nicer so that you're not fighting the room all the time, um, making protection available to everyone with appropriate instructions. There's a really great, has anyone read the paper about the effect, effectiveness of uh, foam earplugs? They basically said most people don't know how to put them in their ears and they just fall out. My wife, they just fall out all the time. She just, her ears just the wrong shape. She can never get them in there. Um, <laughs> quiet zones, designated quiet spaces. So there's somewhere quiet you can go, so you can rest your ears, so you can get a break from the noise. Um, it decreases the risk of hearing damage. And this is what we've come to recently, appropriate training information. Both audience members and staff are made aware of practical steps they can take to ensure safe listening. And one of the things we did uh, during COVID, I did a survey. Um, we sent a survey out to sound engineers um, around the world. So we sent out, uh, I basically joined every Facebook club I could that had anything to do with live sound. So I'm an honorary member of uh, Nigerian Sound Engineers Club, um, Australian Sound Engineers Club, New Zealand Sound Engineers Club, South African Sound Engineers Club. Um, pretty much sent it out to everyone I knew. We sent it out around it. Brazil, best responses per country, Brazil. North America, very disappointing. But Brazil, we had 350 engineers in Brazil all replied. We got we got one from North Korea. We don't know if it's a real one, but we have yeah. someone from North Korea do our survey. We had respondents from 62 different countries. Um, over 2,000 usable surveys came back. And one of the questions that we threw at the last minute was, um, would you be interested in a certification system demonstrating? We were asking them about their knowledge of deep. Decibels, did they understand decibels? Did they understand A weighting, C weighting? Did they understand rolling averages? 
did they understand a lot of the language that we you need to understand or you should be familiar with to be able to discuss sound pressure levels and noise management at festivals and some did some didn't and it was based a lot on experience so there were lots of older experienced engineers who still didn't really understand it and we said would you be interested in the certification system has anyone done their dante training Something along the lines of Dante training. So something where you kind of going, this is the idea I had in my head, is that something you can put on your CV going, I'm Dante level one. I understand basic networking. Or I'm Dante level two. I, I understand advanced networking. And I can prove that because I sat, because I threw away six hours of my life to put building networks in on my computer. So I understand this. And 67% uh, of the respondents, I think, I think what's came back said yes. We would like to do that. So from that, uh, we started looking about, should we educate engineers? And if we're going to educate engineers, my idea is, well, we shouldn't just be educating engineers because part of it was my problem was that I, I had to explain this all to a band's agent because he kept booking us into gigs where they're going, yeah, it's fine, but you can't be allowed in 96db. I'm going, it's not going to happen unless you're booking Heineken Music Hall. So we had this problem of going, people not understanding sound pressure levels, not understanding, not having a thing. So should we be teaching this to uh, agents? Yes, should we be teaching it to production managers, to tour managers, to bar staff, to venue owners, to security, to anyone involved, anyone who's a stakeholder in a live event. So out of that came, uh, a, a wish to provide education to everyone. So at the moment we're working on a certification system called HELA, which is Healthy Ears Limited Annoyance, which is going to give up some basic knowledge to anyone who's interested in noise levels. And so a venue can say, we are HELA certified. We understand the implications of sound, sound pressure levels. We have a basic understanding of it, and we're doing our best to improve it and make it healthy, safer for the people who are coming to our venues. So at the end of the day, it's all to do with a good audience experience, but one that is not damaging their health. So that is where we are at the moment. It should be, it's gone out, it's going to happen because it's been adopted by the Nighttime Industries Association in the UK. So hopefully it'll be out in an optimistic six months, more probable year, possibly two years, you never know with these things. But this is what we're working towards. Uh, I'll keep you updated. And it's all about communication. It's all about communicating with everyone involved in a gig so that the bar staff know, know to go and complain if they can't work because it's too loud. What can we do about it? So the doorman doesn't keep leaving the door open so the neighbours complain about the noise. Oh, I didn't realise the noise would escape. It's, you know, it's, it's the really simple things and it's all to do with that. And it's all about communication. It's the key, and I've run out of time because I've communicated for too long. <laughs> so I'll now give you a chance now to communicate with me through questions and answers for just a couple of minutes. But thank you very thank much, Phil. Do, do we have any questions in the room, Tom? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, you said that at the front of house, it's like 100 dB at 80 kg. Yeah. But obviously, the front of house is different. You said it's in between 30 and 40 meters. Obviously, if you're at 30 meters, it's going to be like 60 to 60 B or more out of the limits at 40 meters. So, is there any like what is it? Because we're nowadays we're using line arrays, aren't we? Yeah. And quite often we'll do what's called gain shade the array. So, gain shade the array basically means we'll turn off the bottom boxes that point to people at the front. And we'll turn up the top boxes that point towards the people at the back. So companies like L Acoustics and DMB have got uh, gain shading now, although they don't call it gain shading because we're not supposed to do that with the line array because it ruins all the game. So, but they'll 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 change the amplitude of the signal so that it throws so the boxes that are at the top that no one at the front is going to hear because they're way over their heads and they're, they're hitting 70, 80 meters. They're going to be running the loudest. The ones right at the bottom that are maybe seven meters from the crowd will be considerably quieter. So we're looking at a successful festival design. You're looking back to front of 6 dB, from the very front of the barrier to the back of the field. 
Um, it's acceptable for it to be further, to be quieter at the back. Why is that? That's people. No, people expect it to be a bit quieter at the back. If you're a bit further away, you expect it to be. Uh, I don't. I don't like standing right at the front because it's louder. I always stand a bit further away. A lot of people like that. It's the youngsters going down the front. You go down the front, it's loud. You like it. <laughs> but we nowadays on most systems, we try and get the speakers. So we're not hitting the audience until the sound has already travelled five to seven metres. Which, if you can imagine, we're flying a PA system on these big shows at seven metres. So the first box is probably seven to nine metres. So you can start doing the maths now. Of <laughs> inverse square or how loud it's going to be on the line array getting to that first point. So <clears throat> it's actually just because you've got that distance doesn't mean that it's going to be 6 dB. 12 dB, 18 dB quieter. Does that make sense? Because we're going to gain shape of the array. Because we're clever at that. Any other questions? Got a couple of questions. We've got a couple of questions online. Um, Elizabeth, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, uh, you were talking about uh, the debate in 2022. Am I right? Oh, you uh, can you hear me? Bit. Can, but you, can you just repeat it? Sorry. Yeah, a little bit muffled on the audio. Maybe if you could type it in. Uh, please, one more time. I couldn't quite hear you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, just say it again, sorry. Say it again. Uh huh. Yeah, please. Say your question again. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about the uh, database from 2022. Am I right? Database from 2022? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking, uh, is it really relevant uh, database? Because, you know, uh, there was uh, COVID-19, so um, uh, everything culture was quite uh, quite done. So it's changing. Uh, now it's changing the culture. And I think it's uh, even changing in the noise and uh, sound and other things. Uh, and it will be uh, changing to the... Uh, of I don't know uh, 2019. So I'm just asking if you were thinking about this or not. Yes, so, um, COVID did have an effect on um, so coming back. Of, I, I think I understand you. Coming back out of COVID, I did some of the first festivals, and it was noticeable that people will listen to things quieter um, because mm -hmm. they've been away from loud loud sounds. So general averages, uh, a lot of the bands at the festival seem to come in a bit quieter. And I certainly mixed a bit quieter coming in off of COVID, probably because I was out of practice of mixing. And I was a bit more, con uh, I, I, I think I'd, there's a general feeling that people did mix a bit quieter. And whether that's going to creep up again, I don't know. But I think with the general, now there's more of an understanding of noise levels and there's more of an impetus, certainly the bigger festivals in the UK, uh, I think it's all come down, except Metallica went and ruined it at Donington this year by being clearly heard by all my colleagues at Darwin University, which is 20 miles away now. Um, <clears throat> but does that answer your question? Probably not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that, thanks for that, Elizabeth. Um, we've got one final question from, from Bird at online. If you'd like to meet yourself, Bird. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I do lots of sounds at festivals and things like that. And um, again, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get a system for to self police myself, really, because obviously not all venues have measuring equipment. And I was just going to say, with the recommendations that you have, it'll be good to have also sort of some kit recommendations for different budget sizes, because you know you got people things like the Ten Easy, which is like it's like a one and a half thousand pound system. Uh, but it's you know it's really good, but it's uh, yeah, it's, it's really uh, expensive. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, um, they, kind of a solution that would kind of you know uh, be be adequate for getting accurate measurements. That'd be that'd be good, basically. Yeah. So I I started off with uh, an old castle analog meter because it had um, it had a slow setting. You want something that's got a slow enough setting that's going to give you an idea of your average. So you're going to give you an idea of, of what you're doing over a longer period than the standard fast or slow setting on a normal meter. Um, 
You can do it now if you want. Do you own a copy of Smart? You can do a 10 easy with Smart now just by buying a microphone, I think. Yeah, um, I'm trying to get the university. It's a bit cheaper. Yeah, yeah just get the university to buy it, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure uh, that'll go down well. <laughs> they um, do an educational partnership so that way students can get a cheaper version of it as well. So that'll be really Yeah, better. you can. Um, so you can, I think you can, uh, you can incorporate to that, but you can do, you can use a program like Smart. Um, but just looking, you need a meter that will do an averaging, really, preferably over 10 minutes. So if you can get something just between 5 and 15 minutes on average, that gives you a really good starting point. Uh, just anything that does a slow enough reading, and that's the trouble, it's finding a meter that does a slow enough reading. And I used, I, I bought a, a castle meter on eBay for 25 quid, and it was really expensive when it was new, but it's out of date now. There'll be cupboards full of them here somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, that do much the same thing. And it's finding something that's slow enough to give you that uh, idea of what the average is going to be. Does that make sense? I like the way I'm looking at that speaker as if you were actually up there. <laughs> I could put my camera on so you can see me. Thank you. But yeah. Um, Does yeah. that help? Yeah, th yeah, that's, um, yeah. I mean, like, uh, for instance, the 10 Easy one, I think that's probably one of the best ones I've ever used. I think I was, did a gig in the Netherlands and, uh, I yeah, it's a really good system. Um, it's mainly good because, uh, and I'll go back to the screen that's got it. Actually, where you can zoom for video of me talking about it. Technology's great, isn't it? Yeah. Just trying to find the screen that's got it. Oh. So you can just about see it here. If it's got. Um, it's got these green lights here. When you've got, uh, <clears throat> as you get closer to hitting the level, you lose green lights and you get the orange lights, then you start getting red lights and it starts going, you should turn down now. You really should turn down now. And it tells you whereabouts you are and gives you a really good solid indication of where you are. So eventually all these greens will go and it'll start going orange, red, red. And when you hit the last red, then you basically, you've, you've tanked it, you've, you've gone over the level. And it'll it'll uh, log what you do, so it'll tell you where you went over the level, how much you went over the level by, and it's gonna it's it's data that stands up in court because it's German DIN standard, so it'll stand up in most European courts. If I knew it's still in Europe, but I'm sure it would be recognised by a British court. Um, but it's a really good system. There's um, you can do it with an NTI meter. Uh, NTI is very simple. Do software that attaches onto an NTI meter. Um, it's anything that does logging over time, really. That's the important thing. Um, but something that's got the good thing about tennis, it's got a really, it's good for people like me because it's kind of idiot proof display. So you can just go, that's green. Green is good. Red is, yes, you've got it bad. Red is bad. Don't let it go red. Amber, yeah. Question from John. I think one of the most interesting challenges here is, is, is festival sites have got multiple stages, in which case one of the classic problems is someone stood you know, kind of by the resident's house going, it's too loud. Which of these 10 stages across it's the site? Is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's what they always say anyway. Yeah, I mean, this is which is why you need multiple meetings to be able to say, actually pinpoint. I got, um, so I don't know if anyone's done Somerset House in London. Uh, Somerset House in London is uh, damaged by the old witch. It backs, it's the old, um, it's old naval buildings and they do concerts in the square. They're surrounded by the buildings, they do concerts in the square. First time I did it was with a really quiet house, it was left given, so it used to be in Port, well, it's the singer in Portishead. Really quiet, no problems. Did it with Prodigy, got noise complaints. And I'm going, well, I'm, I know it's loud, but it's I'm under the limit. It was actually the cafe out the back <laughs> would decide to play Prodigy music loud with the doors open. So it wasn't actually me, it was only because someone went around the back with the noise meter and went, well, actually, it's like 105 here, and it's the cafe playing music. So that's, so it's a really big problem. Has there been any work on kind of with these network monitors that are trying to just find this in any automated fashion that you're aware of? There's, there's going to be a way you can do it with triangulation, isn't there? Well, I don't know if there is. It's, it's, well, you, you would have thought so, but I'm not aware of it. Master, you're not aware of anything that doesn't. Not aware of anything, does it? But it shouldn't be too difficult because you've got 96 there, 96 there, 98 there, 99 there. It's going to be somewhere. Yeah, but it's a question of signal correlation. Yeah. There's all the parts that have towards the time variance. I think there's an interesting little 
I think it's an interesting little PhD there. It's enough to do masters. <laughs> It's going to be a very difficult master's this station. <laughs> yeah, there was more, more challenging <laughs> creation. But yeah, it's this, uh, and it's the sort of thing people are interested in. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem that's not going to go away, and the more it's raised, uh, it's only going to, there's going to be legislation. Now that we've got a WHO document, it's going to be a game changer around the world, because now there's something, what's good about a document like this for a government? No one can really argue against it. How much do they cost them to produce? <laughs> Nothing. So they can just go, well, I think we'll just, should we just do this? And a lot of countries, I think, will just do, particularly the photocopy country, it's going to be going, and it's like 36 pages to photocopy. Yeah, well, we should do it really. <laughs> okay, well, I'll we'll go with that one, shall we? Um, so I think it's going to be adopted a lot more around the world. Um, and. Hopefully we'll see, the, the annoying thing for me is the amount of differences in all the different places. It's just never know where you stand. So it makes it a real struggle. What is it today? What's the level today? I'm trying to get a coherent answer. So I tend to mix the same level every day. Um, <clears throat> some places are really hard. There's a, a gig in Australia in Brisbane, which is called Kangaroo Point. It's on, it's on the river and it's just near all the really expensive houses. There's really expensive houses, you know you've got a really expensive problem. So uh, it's got a DB, it's got really fast one minute uh, measurement and some really, the, the A weighting is almost the same as the C weighting. So basically it's like, yeah, you can have it not very loud with no bass, which for a project gig, it's not a good starting point. Uh, and we keep going back there. And I just then, I just come out of the gig just looking ashen, really, because it's really hard work to try and keep it below. But we're going to see a lot more. I think we'll see it now. This is rolled out the, the WHO document. I'll see it. I think we'll see it, hopefully see a lot more adoption, not just of the levels, which I think are okay. I think they're mixable too. Other engineers will disagree with me. You get other engineers standing up, you'll go, There's no way I can mix that. I, I, I know that's wrong. I, th I know you can mix 100 dB. I've proved it. I've done it on tours. Nobody complained that it was too quiet. If you could do 10,000 people a night and nobody complained it's too quiet, then it's fine. For what is considered a loud band. It's really quick. Uh, the document that you, the document you produce, is it specifically for outdoor gigs, or is it the WHO document? Yeah, or is it? It's, it's produced by the WHO, so I'm I I only cited in it. I had no actual contribution to it apart from the papers that were cited in it. Uh, it's for every single venue for every everything. It's an all-encompassing document produced by the World Health Organization to put it. So it's for the benefit of the world. So to encompass all the different cultural aspects as well. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah, you mentioned on uh, that you, you brought in loads of subs just to do basically 40 hertz and less. Basically to beat the beat, beat the LED cube essentially. Yeah. Is that like uh, if you want it now at the festival, is that a good method it's a really good way of doing a system design yeah it's a good system design because you're you're producing a a more of a solar sensory system solar sensory response because it's a, it's you can feel the bass and i think uh feeling the bass is a really important part of these audio experience uh so this is what i did for my masters so uh, when i applied to it, i was going to do the same course uh mark did at the taught masters and then I realised I'd actually have to go into lessons and everything. Yeah. And uh, then I realised I couldn't do that and be on tour and keep working to pay for it. So I ended up doing a research class and I got 24 hours to think of a research question before the deadline closed. So uh, my supervisor, a very patient then, could you just said, well, what do you know? And I was going base, no base. Um, I'm interested in sub base and I'm interested in concerts. So can I do something to sub base and concerts? So, okay, can you write a hypothesis? My hypothesis was, will increasing uh, the amplitude and uh, two things really, increasing the amplitude and the lower range of uh, sounds, lower frequencies, um, lower the overall DBA level for listening. So that if you are at a festival, if I put in more low frequencies, basically what I'd done three years before, which everyone said wouldn't block people said it wouldn't work. And I kind of, so I decided to go out and prove it. So I, I produced that paper as the result of my, that was my research project. 
And I haven't really stopped. Uh, so the, my, my, I'm doing a PhD at the moment, so I am a student, I do have a student card, um, and it is into audience auditory responses. And I started off with all these things of being interested in travel, but it's just gone out the window, really. I'm back to basically being interested in sub again. So now I'm interested in unconscious and subconscious responses to sound. And I'm not really interested in cochlear hearing. Uh, people are always banging on about your cochlear. It's not that interesting. What about all the rest of you? It's like, you know, there's this little tiny thing inside of your head. Blah, blah, blah. You've got your whole body to listen to sound with. So I'm really interested in that. I'm really interested in how we hear things with the rest of our, with the rest of our body. What's the, has anyone heard the phrase trouser flapping bass? <laughs> so that's interesting, isn't it? What about kick that hit you in the chest? That's exciting. So we did do that. Not interesting. That doesn't interest me. So I'm interested in stuff that's affecting my whole sensory system. And part of that is because I'm interested in fight and flight responses. I'm interested in what gets exciting. What's, what excites us about music? I'm not really interested in... It's, it's the, there's something I say about myself as an engineer. I'm not an engineer of nuance and subtlety. If I was an interested in nuance and subtlety, I wouldn't be working for the prodigy, but I... <laughs> Uh, I'm interested in impact, I'm interested in loudness, I'm interested in dynamics. Part of that comes from the whole body experience. So I'm interested in immersive audio, but not in the way that anyone else is. I'm more dipping them in sound. No, drenching them in sound. Put in my how do you feel that? It's done all that kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good, because it never makes sense to me. <laughs> but hopefully... I did not a little bit um, Obviously that kind of like... Uh, um, you know, you beat the the the, 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 me the measurement. Yeah, but surely you you then that can more like to get a noise complaint. It's that like it can you then turn around and be like, oh, I'm within. Going back to it, I do. We I'm actually pretty good with noise complaints, um, because a lot of the very low frequency stuff I'm doing tends to get lost in the general. Uh, ambience of road noise and things like that. So by the time it's went to the world of general environmental noise, it's nowhere near as loud as the M25. Or is anyone doing wind turbine research? It's, it's you know, I'm, I'm in there with them, I'm muffled by that. I'm muffled by the general noise. Um, I'm nowhere near as annoying as Metallica. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, could you hear it in Manchester? You could definitely hear it in the Derby. Isn't there a Ramstein one? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty pretty well behaved, really. I get on well with most of the noise control. I know all the noise police. They all know me. <laughs> and I get on well with most of them. You know, we have chats and stuff. I've been banned from any festivals. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to be because I'm pretty much retired now, anyway. So I'm pretty much teaching full time. Well, no, I am pretty teaching full time, but I'm actually now concentrating on teaching full time. Well, I'm going off on tour every now and again. But uh, thank you all for listening. Sorry I took up more time than I should have done. And uh, if you've got any questions, Mark's got my email. Yeah. If I've interested, if you've got any more questions about that, uh, there's, just drop me an email. Um, you can find me. There's an interesting thing in me shouting about how to how I use a 10 easy, which is on YouTube. It's various things about me on YouTube. Um, and you can always find me via LinkedIn as well. So thank you very much for listening and I'll catch you again soon.